designed in a manner that is almost quintessentially 80s, the Beechcraft Starship was a strange but revolutionary executive transport aircraft that became a staple of that excessive and opulent decade. Unfortunately, in spite of its outrageous looks and innovative flight characteristics, the Starship would ultimately end up being one of the biggest commercial failures in aviation history, and has today cemented itself as an obscure part of aircraft lore. The Beach Aircraft Corporation, now known as Beechcraft, was founded in 1932 by husband and wife Walter and Olive Ann Beach, and through the first four decades of its existence, established itself as a major player in the creation of general aviation and military aircraft, including the Model 18 transport aircraft of 1937, Bonanza of 1947, and perhaps its most famous product, the Baron, a twin-engined light aircraft that has been in production since 1961 and has sold nearly 7,000 units worldwide. By 1979, Beechcraft dominated the turboprop market with the King Air, launched in 1963 and derived from the earlier Queen Air of 1960, while also forming the basis of the later Super King Air of 1972, which enlarged the design and gave it dimensions that made it suitable for use as an executive transport. Sadly, Beechcraft, despite the success of its King Air range, suffered greatly at the hands of both the 1973 and 1979 oil crises, with the subsequent economic recession of both events causing a major downturn in the purchase of light aircraft as the demand for pleasure flights and general aviation dried up. Still under the ownership of Olive Ann Beach, who had been CEO of the firm since her husband's passing in 1950, she eventually allowed Beechcraft to be purchased by the Raytheon Company on February 8, 1980, the latter being a Massachusetts-based multinational conglomerate that specialised in aerospace and defence. Upon the buyout of Beechcraft, Raytheon decided that since the company still held a dominant position in the world of turboprops, their best course of action would be to build on the success of the King Air range by developing an advanced turboprop that would be larger and faster, but at the same time deliver equal levels of luxury and comfort, while also exhibiting flight characteristics and speed that would be comparable to most contemporary business jets, including the Cessna Citation, the Learjet 35, and the Grumman Gulfstream II. However, Beechcraft wanted to go one step further by creating an aircraft based on carbon fibre composite materials rather than the more conventional aluminium or other metals, thereby making the airframe extremely light and improving the performance significantly. Composite airframe elements had previously been proven on aircraft such as the Northrop YF-17 Cobra, a lightweight prototype fighter jet built for the US Air Force, which incorporated over 900 pounds worth of graphite epoxy composite into its design, although a majority of the structure was constructed using aluminium. In January 1980, the first concept, known as Preliminary Design 330, or PD-330, was unveiled and wind-tested, with the general design being a low-wing monoplane with nose-mounted canards to improve low-speed lift, and rear-mounted pusher engines that produced greater thrust and reduced cabin noise for a smoother passenger experience similar to that of a jet. Once early faults had been ironed out of the wind tunnel models, Beechcraft signed a deal with Mojave-based aerospace company Scaled Composites on August 25, 1982, to create a proof-of-concept aircraft which would be 85% scale, with Scaled Composites making their own significant alterations to the concept with the addition of variable geometry to the canard. Improvements to the PD-330 were undertaken by Bert Rattan, a designer at Scaled Composites, but faced early problems with regard to the weight of the aircraft's engines and wings at the rear, drawing the nose wheel off the ground although these initial concerns didn't phase the eager Raytheon. In order to deliver optimal performance, Rattan implemented a long swept wing configuration, which, when combined with the composite construction materials, allowed the PD-330 to fly at speeds faster than Mach 0.7, or approximately 537 miles an hour, only 20 miles an hour slower than a Boeing 747-200. The proof-of-concept aircraft first took to the skies in August 1983, but the plane was basically just an empty airframe with no pressurization system, no certified avionics, and different overall design and material specifications to that of the planned production model, which was now known as the Model 2000. While the POC was only used for early test flights, and later scrapped once examinations were complete, the information gathered during these trials helped to inform the design of several pre-production prototypes, but Beechcraft, in their haste, constructed them before development work had been finalised, resulting in each prototype being incrementally modified to match every new advancement in the technology. The rationale behind this was to reduce construction expenses, 
as due to the aircraft's composite build, it would have been cost prohibitive to create multiple from scratch prototypes repeatedly. In total, three full scale airworthy prototypes were built NC 1, which first took to the skies on February 15, 1986, and was used for aerodynamic testing, as well as being the only starship equipped with conventional electromechanical avionics, NC 2, which was used for avionics and systems testing, and NC 3, which was used for flight management systems and power plant testing. The construction process was sadly not a smooth one for the Starship, with delays being incurred due to underestimations in the complexity and manufacturing of the aircraft, problems including issues regarding the composite construction, technical difficulties of correcting a pitch damping problem, and developing the store warning system. While the Starship was a radical piece of aviation engineering, the use of a forward wing, or canards, required a complex series of air speed and lift monitors in order to ensure stability at lower speeds and the aircraft also featured early versions of the Electronic Flight Instrument System, or EFIS. However, as such technology was very primitive, rather than having no more than three to six CRT monitors with switchable displays that could toggle through the primary flight, navigation and engine indication screens, as per modern airliners like the Boeing 747-400, the EFIS for the Beechcraft Starship was displayed over 16 individual CRT monitors and displays, all of which emitted significant levels of heat and thus required the fitting of avionics cooling fans. Although the aircraft was lauded for its stability, courtesy of the forward canards, this came at the price of speed, and with the addition of the heavy monitors and avionics, the final production model weighed in at £15,000, while the total cost for the development of the project was $300 million, or $610 million in 2020. In the end, the first production Starship took to the skies on April 25, 1989, and was noted by the aviation press due to its strange mixture of forward canards, a pusher engine configuration, carbon fiber composite airframe, and vertical stabilizers being placed on the ends of the wings rather than centrally. Unfortunately, the odd new design of the Starship didn't translate into sales, and during its first three years of production only 11 units were sold, with private owners unwilling to make the full $3.9 million payment for these aircraft due to the rigors of their operation and unproven technology. Much of the criticism towards the Starship was the fact that, despite early prototypes demonstrating it could fly at over 500 miles an hour, the heavier final product could only travel at a top speed of 385 miles an hour over a range of 1,742 miles and at a service ceiling of 41,000 feet, while the rival Learjet 35 could fly at 542 miles an hour over a range of 2,874 miles and at 45,000 feet. The Starship even compared poorly to other turboprop models, with the rival Piper PA-42 Cheyenne being able to fly at 403 miles an hour over a 2,200 mile range and at a service ceiling of 41,000 feet, while also sporting a retail price that was $1 million less than the Starship. This, combined with the economic recession that followed the Gulf War of 1991, meant that Beechcraft chose instead to lease Starships through fixed contracts to private owners, but this again failed to stimulate demand. In the end, only 53 aircraft were produced, with the final unit, NC-53, leaving the factory in 1995, but Beechcraft maintained full tooling and spares in order to keep both their fleet of leased and privately owned units airworthy. This, unfortunately, was extremely uneconomical, as creating custom-built spare parts for a fleet of only 53 aircraft was a loss-making proposition, one that Beechcraft finally axed in 2003. In an attempt to cut their losses, Beechcraft opted to strip down and incinerate both their own fleet of starships for leasing, while also offering the few remaining private owners the opportunity to trade in their starships for updated models such as the Premier One jet, rather than continuing to supply custom spare parts at their expense. Redundant starships became a prominent feature of airports across the American Southwest, with around 23 units laid up at the Pinal Air Park and the Marana Regional Airport in Arizona being stripped for spares before eventual scrapping. However, despite the recall and destruction of the starships by Beechcraft, six are known to still be airworthy as of 2020, with NC-33 and NC-50 being owned and operated by an engineering firm in Addison, Texas, NC-35 and NC-45 being based in Oklahoma, NC-51 being based in Colorado, and NC-29 being based in Germany, although it's registered in Delaware. Much of the reason behind the survival of these starships, despite their complex technology, 
is that to this day Rockwell Collins continues to maintain full support for the AMS-850 avionics suite, and while Beechcraft no longer provide on-demand spare parts, the scrapping of other starships means there are a plentiful supply of components on the market that can be reused to keep the remaining operational examples airworthy. Other than those flown by private owners, eight are known to be preserved, seven of which are in the United States, while the last, NC-28, is on display at the Queensland Air Museum at Calundra Airport in Australia. In summary, the Starship was an endearing but problematic business aircraft which was far too cutting edge for its own good, with the pursuit of Beechcraft and Raytheon to develop a state-of-the-art model ultimately being its Achilles heel. Once the complicated avionics and flight controls had been added, any performance benefits derived from its innovative but expensive composite airframe was lost, and all that resulted was a pretty face, behind which was hidden a largely underwhelming aircraft that thought big but achieved little. Thanks again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, why not leave a like, and be sure to subscribe for more great content. Thank you very much, take care, and I'll see you next time.